call the meeting to order. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I know. Thank you. We have no written communication. Reports of boards and committee, I think I remember seeing something that you had something. Yeah, with the legislative committee, uh, it began with much sadness about Mrs. Cole. Was that supposed to be that? No, yeah. Are you a alumni? Of the legislative committee? Yeah. Nope. They asked about you. Okay. No, I'm not. He is. You're the... Um, you used to be the legislative person. I you. used to be the legislative. Yeah. Joe O'Malley said, where's Mrs. Goldman? Well, for crying out loud. <laughs> Maybe they're anticipating. Well, she is a shining star, so That's we have right. to, you know. That's right. All right, so they welcome all the new members. They describe for us the function of the team for the new members. Uh, we did a round table, so we basically which district you're from, what other committees have you ever served on, and why do you want to serve on this committee? So a uh, quick bio for everybody. You know, a lot of work done on the website. I don't know if anybody's been on the website in the last few weeks. Yeah, this is it. Um, so if you have been on the website, take a dive. There's a lot of helpful function and, and information on there. Um, a lot of time spent talking about the digital divide. We understand what that means. Children that have access to technology and those that are not, it's not as available. So a lot of open discussion about how to close the digital divide. And obviously we didn't want to answer that committee, but that was a, probably the longest discussion. Um, let me turn. Great. Any other updates? All right. We'll move right into the report. Great. We have two financial reports tonight. The first one is from Dresser and Malecki on our external audit report. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. All right. Yes. Is it okay? Yes. All right. You spray it down. Well, good evening. I'm going to test this out to see how it's going to flip through. Or if it's not going to, it's not. So I'll do the page function. I'm a partner at Dresher Milwaukee um, audit firm, and the district hires us to perform the annual external audit on your financial statements. So here tonight, happy to be here in person. There's been an awful lot of Zoom and virtual meetings, so it's you know it's refreshing to get out and see some people in person. We've met with management and the audit committee over the course of the last couple of weeks and went over the draft financial statements and related letters um, in more detail than I'll go into tonight, just a, a brief presentation tonight. Uh, we're in the position to release the financial statements. They're in final draft form, so presented tonight for the board's approval. And in the approval, we'll be in the position to issue uh, by an October 15th deadline that the district is subject to. So on the slideshow, at the end of each audit, four main products. Um, quickly, why are we hired? The district hires us to provide our opinion on the financial statements. And why that's important is because the users of your financial statements, whether it be banks, ratings agencies, taxpayers, um, they want that independent third party unbiased verification that the financial statements that are put together and maintained by management of the district throughout the year that they can be relied upon that they're accurately stated so that's our role we come in and perform a series of risk assessment and tests to come up with our opinion on whether those financial statements can be relied upon 
Uh, we are prepared to issue what's called an unmodified opinion. That's a clean opinion, which means we, um, we do believe that the financial statements are fairly stated. So the first product is just that, the basic financial statements. That's going to include your balance sheet items, so all your balances at June 30th, 2020, for all the funds of the district, as well as the revenue and expenditure activity for the 12 months that are on. At the back of that basic financial statement package is what's called the single audit. The district receives a certain level of federal awards. So federal aid comes in and you administer various programs. And as a result of that, you're subject to a federal compliance audit that's called a single audit. Um, that portion of the report is included at the back of the basic financial statements. A management letter, we present some observations if we had any during the audit that were worth documenting, as well as provide any best practices or recommendations that we might have had after looking through the different internal control cycles and comparing you to different districts throughout the area. The auditor communications letter, this simply reviews the terms of the engagement. It sort of outlines what were the responsibilities of Joshua Malecki as your auditor and what were the responsibilities of the district and in particular management throughout the course of the audit. Uh, if there was anything significant that changed the way that the audit was performed, we'd include it in that letter. Finally, the extra classroom activity report is a smaller financial statement and that includes the activity of the different clubs and activities maintained under the extra classroom activity fund at the district. That audit is performed under the guidance of New York State Audit. Are there any questions on the performance of the audit before we get into the brief financial highlights? So first up is a line graph showing your five years of revenue and expenditure activity. The blue line is going to be your revenues, red line is going to be your expenditures and spending. You can see the five year trend over the course of the period has been an increase on both sides, expenditures and revenues, with the exception of most recently the expenditures for fiscal year 1920. Comes to no surprise, the shutdown related to COVID impacted over three months of this fiscal year and you experience some savings because of decreased spending. Um, looking at end of year results for 1920, your revenues increased modestly from last year. They're up to $59.9 million compared to last year's uh, 58 and a half. And on the expenditure side, it went from $57 million down to 56.6. .6. So just a little over a million dollars decrease there. And when you take a look at total revenues of just about 60 million, take away the spending of about 57, total fund balance in the general fund increased $3.3 million as a result of the fiscal year 1920. That $3.3 million increase the fund balance, or if you want to refer to it as a surplus of revenues and excess of expenditures, that goes into and results as an increase in your total fund balance. And your fund balance is simply your equity position. So, as you can see here, last five years, the larger jump from last year to the year 1920, that's the $3.3 million. You went from 7.8 million of fund balance at the end of last year up to 11.1 .1 million at June 30th, 2020. Now on this graph, we split up the fund balance into a couple categories, and it's based on the liquidity or how restricted are those amounts for spending by the district. So the red amounts are your reserves, the restricted fund balances, and they have their unique characteristics and restrictions on how they're to be funded and how they can be accessed for spending as well. Those amounts remain relatively consistent compared to last year. Reserves still stay funded at about the same level as last year. Now where you see the increase from the current year operations is on the unrestricted portion. It went from 3.5 million up to 6.5 million dollars. The lion's share of that, five and a half million dollars, is the unassigned fund balance in the general fund. That's the dollar amount that most people look at if they're gonna pick up your financial statements and they're going to focus it on any one number, general fund, unassigned fund balance. So we'll cover that on the next slide. 
Um, but the remaining $1 million in unrestricted are amounts that were assigned in next year's budget and also for encumbrances. That makes up the, the last million dollars. So the last financial slide is focusing in on that unassigned fund balance level. And as you see, it went from 2.4 million up to 5.5 million. The district decided, you know, how are we going to handle reporting the savings that was experienced during 2019-20 fiscal year? And they said, all right, given the uncertainty of future revenues, given the uncertainty of what challenges on as far as additional spending might be brought up as a result of this COVID environment, they said, let's take that surplus and put it all in unassigned fund balance, essentially, until we know better what's going to happen. Because we have a, a feeling that there's going to be some new spending that has to be done. And rather than try to put these amounts into the reserves and have them not locked up, but much more difficult to gain access to, to spend, they're going to maintain it in the unassigned fund balance. If you recall, school districts in New York State are subject to a, a real property tax law 4% calculation. So as a result of reporting the surplus from 1920 in unassigned fund balance, there's going to be a compliance finding in this year's financial statements, just stating that it's in excess of the 4%. Uh, the district is well aware of this. It was done you know, basically in efforts of transparency and really a conservative measure to protect that money in case it's needed to tap into during this, this fiscal year or maybe even subsequent years as well. Um, again, with that, this philosophy of taking the surplus from 1920 putting it in unassigned and exceeding a 4%, you're not the only local district. I'm not here to name the different districts, but you're not alone in going this route and taking this philosophy. Um, it, it seems that that was a, a popular choice this year. Finally, just observations. So here I do have some contact information. I think this will be made available if it wasn't already to the board. Um, overall, this audit is different than past years. Primarily it was done in a remote environment. We stayed at the office. There were a, a couple limited visits to the district building. Um, but it really took an increased level of cooperation and coordination from the district. Really, Laura, Treasurer Williams, the whole business office staff, anyone that we dealt with during the audit, you know, compliments to them. It was different. It was, I think, more work because there are some things that just aren't ready to send over electronically to us for, for all the testing that we do. Um, so we really appreciate making it the, the best and easiest audit that we could do this year. But we did have a full scope. We didn't um, you know, have any limits as to what we could look at this year. Because of the COVID remote audit, we still had full access to the records and had no issues getting through. There are no reportable findings in internal control, no material weaknesses, no significant deficiencies. So that's, that's a good mark on the report card. That single audit that I referred to on the first slide over the federal compliance, you do a rotation of what program is tested each year. You don't test every dollar. Uh, this year, the child nutrition cluster was tested, and there are no reportable compliance findings as a result of that single audit. That just about wraps it up. Trying to you know cover a month-long audit in, in a brief presentation, but if there are any questions or comments now, I'd be happy to, to address them. Has there been any comments out of Albany uh, as far as how they're going to treat or look at you know, the districts that have gone over the 4% or is it still too early? Uh, I believe it's still too early. There has been some review comments. It seems that the state has been quicker in their review of the ST3 report. So that's an unaudited annual financial report that the district provides to the state and they are looking at their 4% calculation, um, but there hasn't been anything published on, on how they'll treat it in the audited financial statements yet.
Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We also have um, Rick Gancy here from Capital Markets to uh, talk about investments and our schedule of debt service. Yeah. No, I don't, yeah. Thanks for being here. Well, thanks for having me again. Um, I know that um, there were some questions I think that were addressed by the board with respect to you know, debt service, local share, uh, impact the taxpayers, potential questions on investments and what the district could be doing maybe differently uh, and what it's doing now. Um, so I thought it would be helpful you know, to frame the discussion of, because most districts say, you know, how do I compare with you know, my neighbors? You know? So what I did was I put together um, a pretty comprehensive comparison of Amherst versus, we'll call them the local districts, you know, here in Erie County. Um, just to kind of get a sense of sort of where you stack up, uh, you know, with your peers locally. Um, so when you get rated by Moody's Investor Service um, on an ongoing basis, both for issuance of bonds as well as, um, you know, annual surveillance, uh, they put together essentially a scorecard. Um, the scorecard consists of Things such as economic demographic data, you know, debt service uh, ratios, um, financial ratios, uh, and then management. Uh, so they look at you know all of the districts, um, you know, metrics if you will across the board. They come up with an assessment of sort of where you are from a uh, rating perspective. So as you recall from prior you know rating or prior board meetings, the district currently rated AA3 by Moody's, which is on the higher end of sort of what we see statewide. Locally, it's about, you know, a little bit higher than average of what we see, you know, what's New York districts. Um, you look at your comparison to other districts throughout the state, or out, actually through the area, uh, and you look at sort of how you compare, you know, to your peers in each of the metrics to kind of get a sense of, you know, where your weaknesses might be and where your strengths are. Um, Obviously, we always talk about you know fund balance, right? So fund balance, in the eyes of the rating agencies, is sort of the I'll call it not the only thing they look at, but it's become very critical. Um, as we've discussed in the past, you know, you at the AA3 level, you know, are still sort of within that range by way of fund balance percentage as a percentage of revenues. But as you can see from the comparison, that those credits that are higher than your district. You know, namely Iroquois and um, Clarence and Williamsville schools, which is the highest rated school district um, in, the, in the upstate New York. Um, you look at their fund balance levels and, and debt service um, numbers and wealth levels in particular, the, the wealth levels of Clarence and Orchard Park and, you know, um, you know, Williamsville are certainly much higher than what we, you know, experience here within your district. So. The things that you control, obviously, are you know debt service, you know how much the debt burden is as a percentage of, of expenditures, as well as your uh, fund balance. So the trend that we've been seeing, and again, we don't put into the 2020 numbers yet because obviously they're just being approved tonight. But the trend is just something we need to be just cognizant of that you know if the trend obviously continues with the drawn fund balance, you kind of see where you let you stack up with those credits that are, you know, one notch below you, uh, which would be the A1 level as opposed to AA3. Um, you know, we think on the debt side, you know, you stack up quite well, um, you know, with other districts, it, it, it sort of your peer districts. Um, while the total power amount outstanding of the bonds is a little bit higher than others, we think the offset of that is that the uh, district, you know, pays off its debt rather rapidly. Um, you know, 86%, I believe, 87% of the principal is paid off in the first 10 years. Um, and you have a, another offset to that as your building aid ratio. So your building aid ratio at 75% uh, is higher than you know, most of the peers that we would see 
you know, within this um, you know, group that we've selected. So I think you know this I thought would be helpful just to kind of see you know, how you stack up against others and maybe you kind of use this as a tool to see where other credits stand as far as their ratings go, you know, both weaker and stronger, to kind of use as a tool to sort of move forward and potentially work to um, improve the rating going forward. And again, the improvement of the rating really comes into managing, you know, fund balance and finances to get to that point. Obviously, this isn't the best environment to start building fund balance, but it's something that we could certainly uh, continue to think about. Um, so if you look at other credits, you know, like East Aurora, Depew, um, the weaker credits, um, really you look at their fund balance levels, their wealth levels, obviously below sort of where we are in here in Amherst. Um, particularly East Aurora has strong tax base, but again, their, their fund balance has been slowly declining over several years, and they, you know, were downgraded not too long ago, basically because of the um, you know, fund balance decline. So, um, any questions you might have on comparisons or sort of how you stack up with others, um, I'm certainly, you know, happy to address those. Uh, if not, we could talk a little bit about um, sort of investment strategies without crossing the line of our fiduciary duty as a municipal advisor, not an investment advisor. <laughs> well, just, yeah, so one of the questions I have is I was, I had read the Moody's report. Sure. And, um, you know, one of the factors that could lead uh, to a downgrade would be a significant increase in debt. And they actually mentioned that um, in one of their last lines that um, that issuance will be significantly smaller over the next several years. So, what do you suppose us adding to any additional debt from where we are now? would do to that. Yeah, so when you look at sort of the um, the profile of the district now, right, so you have the bond issue we just did earlier this year to fund the last capital project. Um, the district does have a fall off, significant fall off in, in debt service in the 25, 26 fiscal year. Um, so again, may seem like, you know, quite a ways away, but you think about the process of when the project voted on, you know, when it goes to the State Education Department for review, when you actually, you know, design the project and bid and award, you could be looking at, you know, three to four-ish years out before you actually start bringing on debt. Um, so the thought process there is as that debt falls off, um, you sort of fill in some of those holes with, you know, a new capital project, if you will. And that incremental increase in debt would sort of remain flat versus, um, you know, where you are currently. Uh, so if you keep adding projects now, obviously it has you know, somewhat of an impact on the debt service side. But what you benefit from that most districts downstate don't is your building aid ratio is, is quite high. Uh, so the story to Moody's obviously has been, while the debt service is increasing, you know, 77 cents out of every dollar is paid for by state building aid as opposed to some wealthier districts in Westchester where it's 10%. Um, so there's sort of that balance between needing to do projects just to maintain the infrastructure and being cognizant of sort of when debt falls off, when local share decreases, to know that we're bringing on a project during that time so that we're not starting the planning phase five years out when we have you know this dip off um, in 2025, 26. Yeah. So, I don't have any questions on like, comparisons. Um, we'll talk briefly about you know the investment. Um, so, you know what we've seen, Dominic. I mean, you follow the markets quite regularly as well. Um, you know what we're seeing, obviously, in the market. You know now is that you know school districts and municipalities in the state are limited by way of you know, investment. So, schools can't go out and you know purchase assets and hedge funds and all these you know, kind of wacky investment strategies that we would see otherwise in the you know, securities market. So the, the school districts in the state are governed by um, what's called general municipal law, section 11, which essentially lays out the permitted investments that school districts in New York, all municipalities in New York can invest in, um, as well as your own investment policy. 
So the purpose of that general municipal law, obviously, is to protect you know taxpayers and, 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 and districts that they're not getting into something that uh, becomes problematic. You know, like certain states, like Pennsylvania, you know, their schools got in trouble with you know interest rate swaps years ago, which created a huge disaster for some schools down in Pennsylvania. So things that you can invest in are you know pretty plain vanilla, U.S. Treasuries. CDs, money markets, um, general obligation debt of New York State, um, those are typically what we would see you know, schools entering into. Um, most schools lately have done um, you know, US Treasuries just because sort of it's a you know, fairly safe asset that protects your, you know, protects your money. And then on the investment side, as far as money markets and CDs, uh, in New York State, um, those have to be collateralized, you know, with with the bank. So there's the added cost, obviously, to not only do you have deposits on it, but the bank has to collateralize those with either U.S. Treasuries or some federal home home, home loan bank uh, line of credit. Um, so the collateralization is either one of those two, Treasuries or FHLB um, securities. So. You're really limited as far as yield goes based on you know, where the market is. Um, the U.S. Treasury market, what we've seen, you know, leading up to about early March was, you know, yields, you know, one month Treasuries was, you know, 120-ish, somewhere around there, things were going well. And actually the district um, locked in, I think, a Treasury, um, Treasury bill in late February. Uh, February 20, something around there, at 137, I think it was, to mature in August of, um, of this year. Ironically enough, two weeks after that, the market tanked. Um, so there was a point in mid-March where the Treasury yields actually went negative. Um, right now they're sitting at about nine basis points um, as compared to 130 something that was not too long ago. So the district really you know, worked out well for them to lock in that rate at the time. Unfortunately, with Treasury rates being so low now, there really isn't much of an opportunity, I think, to um, you know, increase yield. Um, you think about sort of going out on the yield curve, you know, whether or not it makes sense to go more long term. Obviously, the State Insurance Office puts out guidelines regarding investments. Um, what we always kind of see our clients do in following the State Insurance guidelines is that um, you don't want to go out too far down the road by way of an investment um, because you don't know the uncertainty of sort of what's going on, right? So if you go out six months on investment and the state decides to you know, start cutting, you know, building a state aid and everything else that kind of we expect to happen, you don't want to put your position, your position to the district to have a lack of liquidity in the sense that. Um, if bills need to be paid and things need to happen, that you're not locked up with you know, long-term investments. So we see most school districts in the state, you know, keep the investments short-term. You know, liquid money markets, um, some CDs, some treasuries that go out a couple months. Uh, that seems to be the sort of the, the norm of what we see, uh, you know, throughout the state. Um, so we talked about that. Yeah, you know, the only thing that I, I would point out that. We did notice that you know, general municipal law section 11 versus your investment policy. Um, I don't believe your investment policy allows for um, GML uh, allows for investing school district dollars in uh, revenue anticipation notes and tax anticipation notes of other jurisdictions in the state. Uh, we've seen a lot of not a lot, but back when the yields were a little higher. Uh, we've seen some school districts and municipalities with available cash go out and purchase rands and tans of other school districts that may have a need cash flow wise or other municipalities that have sort of a different schedule of when they need cash versus when they have cash. Uh, so something that if you look at in a future board meeting when you're updating your investment policy it might make sense just to add that for some flexibility. Um, in this market we don't think it's something that's going to be of real value, but it just down the road it could add um, some flexibility. So that is under general general municipal law section 11, uh, and that's the investment of uh, notes issued under section 24 and 25 of local finance law, which is grants and tans. Um, so we've seen some school districts sort of add that 
just as a flexibility. But beyond that, you follow general municipal law, and there's really not much outside of what the state allows um, to invest in. So that's helpful to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, that, that, and, and I actually thought us investing in you know, some, of the, some of the different bonds potentially would make some sense. I mean, I know. I don't think if we did a ban, which is not that we need, that they would give us 0 0.09 as a, as a rate, so sure. they would charge us a bit more than that. Yeah, so, you, so other school districts in the state can't um, invest in other bans, but just the RANs and the TANs, with the approval of the state controller's office. So there's that sort of added layer of protection that the school districts aren't investing in something that they think may not be safe. So if you wanted to buy you know, RANs from Sweet Home Schools, you could purchase those directly with the approval of the state controller's office. And we've seen that sort of happen you know, in the past with other schools and municipalities. I guess this is a but I was thinking that maybe we should set up a, another committee for the board for investments, policies, or whatever, like we did with the tax surgery, um, only to try to be a benefit. Um, you know, to uh, people that are running it now. My one concern is if rates go negative, and like you said, they did, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if we had a maturity coming up and, um, you know, we had negative rates, what were we going to do? Yeah, that's so. kind of what happened, you know, lately. You were at 137 locked in from end of February till, it, till August, and when that note came due in August, there's really nothing, you know, to invest in. Um, and you could invest in, you know, state general obligation, you know, issuances, but as you know, it's tough to find specific maturities that are available in the duration that you're looking for that are readily available in the secondary market, which becomes a little challenging. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you have to almost kind of look for a block of bonds that mature in a specific time frame through some agreement with, you know, a third party, but that becomes difficult to manage. Um, when you can't really go out long term um, with your obligations. I, mean, I, I just think it's one of the things that um, that we can kind of control. Sure. I mean, right now we can't because rates are rates are where they're at, yeah. and um, I, I don't think they'll stay here forever. Yeah. And when they do, I just think that you know we need to be ready to you know take advantage of sure. what comes. So that's that's my thought. Just one, one other thing. I, like I, I noticed that the MTAs have all gotten cut like once, twice, three times. I think maybe this. Are they looking to do that with the school districts if, you know, these 20% cuts? Yeah, I believe your um, August payment was cut. State aid, we're talking about the state aid payment? Yeah. Yeah, I believe the August payment was, was cut. The September, I understand, was not because the aid payment received by school districts in September directly goes to the state retirement uh, uh, payment. That one, the, the TRS was Yeah, so that, that wasn't cut from what I understand, which just kind of a pass through from the state to the retirement plan. But um, things are getting sort of um, troubled at the state. Uh, Moody's just down, downgraded the state's credit um, Thursday night. Um, so we're kind of seeing that begin to sort of come forth that the state obviously is having very significant fiscal issues. But we have a Moody's downgrade and then we expect Fitch and SP to follow as well. Um, but most schools are preparing for, you know, 20% cut, you know, across the board, including building aid, which becomes challenging. Um, so it's something that obviously we're dealing with and I'm sure Bo and her staff are we're looking at, you know, cash flow borrowing as an option. We've seen a lot of uh, RANs and TANs and some deficiency notes being issued by schools to cover shortfalls. Um, so it's something that we're talking to a lot of our clients on as far as how to manage through the crisis if the state begins to withhold significant amounts of revenues and you know, how do you deal with that. And the three tools really you have are the, the RANs, TANs, or what's called the deficiency notes, um, which is an option as well. Those are really the three things that you can do from a borrowing perspective. Questions? 
Thank you for having me, Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate you coming out. Greg, did you send me a copy of uh, that schedule? I remember last time we met, we were looking at different scenarios. You had the years with where the bonds land when they fall off. I can share that. Yeah, we have that into it. Yeah, that's what we modeled up. You know, the potential price. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Yeah. We will need a motion for new business items. I'll make a motion for new business items E1, E2, E3, D, 3B, D, and G. We have a second. Second. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor of new business items E1, A through E, 2, A through D, and 3, B, D, and G, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. This is custodian follow up action items. Did you want, I wasn't sure, but I wrote it down. Did you want to review the district investment policy? Do you have district Yes, we have it. Yeah, we do. Um, so I did. Yeah, I was thinking like maybe Gene uh, and I can get with Tony in our agenda setting and put that in so we can see for whatever for a future board meeting to maybe update that or whatever we need to look at for that. So. And the other uh, item I have is that Capital Market will send a copy of the debt schedule. Great. That will need a motion to go into executive session. I'll make a motion to go into executive session to discuss matters regarding the collective bargaining negotiation and the employment of the person. We have a second. Second. Mr. Smith. All those in favor of adjourning to executive session, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Patrick, thank you for coming.